Now we come to Roswell, everybody fa everybody's favorite small town. And not Roswell, Georgia, there is one of those too. Uh, okay, how the heck did I get involved in that? I was minding my own business. I was at a television station in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, supposedly to do three interviews to promote my lecture that night at LSU. And I'd done the first two. This is in 1978. The third reporter was nowhere to be found, and this is before cell phones. Some of you have trouble believing there was a time before cell phones, but there really was. And the station manager's giving me coffee. He knew I had other things to do. He's looking at his watch. He didn't want to lose the interview, but where the heck was the reporter? And out of the blue, he says, uh, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. Now, being the brilliant investigator I am, I said, who's he? His next sentence changed my life. He handled pieces of the wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? Where'd that come from? You know, it snuck up on me totally. What do you know about him? He lives over in Homa. That didn't tell me anything. I didn't know where Homa was. I've been there since. It's a city in Louisiana. It's pretty good size. Uh, to see Jesse, of course. We're old ham radio buddies. He's a great guy. You ought to talk to him. Okay. Next day from the airport, I call information. You know, they used to give out phone numbers over the phone, you know, without the internet kind of thing. Uh, got a number for Jesse A. Marcel. Talked to him. Mentioned Bill Allen, the television station manager. Now, people say, well, why did he talk to you? Because he's one of the few people that couldn't deny his involvement. His name was, as I found out later, was all over newspaper articles. His picture was in a lot of newspapers. So he could say, oh, I didn't have anything to do with that. And because I had the name of Bill Allen and so forth, and I sounded like a nice, trustworthy guy, you know, anyway, he talked to me and told me a story. He didn't have an exact date. I shared that story with Bill Moore, a colleague that I'd known in Pittsburgh, and a few months later, I'm in Bemidji, Minnesota. I hit the real highlights, you know. Uh, my biggest tour ever started at Central South Carolina, another big town. You know? Anyway, in Bemidji, I heard another story about a crash saucer in New Mexico. Passed that on to Bill, who lived in Minnesota at the time. He had a third story from uh, the Flying Saucer Review, an English publication. An English actor named Newey Green was driving across the United States from L.A. to Philadelphia. And he heard on the radio about a crash saucer in New Mexico. Now, he could pin down the date because it wasn't a trip you made very often. You can imagine what the roads were like back in 1947. 47 wasn't close enough, you see, because there were loads of sightings in 1947 after Kenneth Arnold's famous case on June 24th. He had a son living in Canada. Bill talked to him. First week of July, about. So Bill went to the University of Minnesota Library, periodicals department, of course. There was a story verified what I'd been told by Jesse Marcel, gave us a bunch more names. We went to work, and the next year and a half, we found 62 people in conjunction with the case. Now, sometimes you get lucky. Luck is what happens when you're ready for it, or I don't know what the phrase is, but I looked in a book, editor and publisher, was there a newspaper in Roswell? I didn't know anything about Roswell. I do now, but uh, yeah, the Roswell Daily Record. So I called. Ask for the editor from 1947. Well, long gone, what do you need? I've got this article here that says a guy named Walter Holt, Hout, his name is spelled four different ways in the newspaper articles. Once we had the date, I could look all over. Uh, and before I could finish the sentence, she says, oh, his wife works here. What? I didn't expect anybody to be there now. Walter's from Chicago. What the heck's he doing in Roswell? <laughs> 1978, after having been stationed there in the military in 1947. I got lucky. Okay. I also got lucky. I called information for a number for anybody named Brazel, the rancher's name. What city? I don't know. Southeastern New Mexico. Oh, I got a Bill Brazel in Carrizozo. Is that in southeastern New Mexico? It shows you how much I knew. Yes. Okay. Well, that turns out to be the rancher's son. He'd just gotten his phone two weeks before. 
So, you know, luck is what happens when you're ready, I guess. Anyway, we found 62 people by 1980 when the first book came out, The Roswell Incident by Bill and Charles Berlitz, the language guy, you know. Uh, I got a percentage of Bill's royalties. Berlitz spoke 30 languages, incidentally. Berlitz Language School, that was his grandfather. How would you like to grow up when your mother talks one language, your father another, your grandfather third, and the nanny a fourth? That's how you learn languages. He did some spy work, because they had all the languages down pat. Right accent, everything, wherever he went. Interesting guy. Uh, okay, here's the article from the paper. A paper. Now, as it happens, the uh, congressman from Minnesota was on a television program that I did. If that was such an important event, how come it only appeared in the Roswell paper? I said, I sent the people on this program five different newspapers, including the Chicago Daily News, News and the Sacramento Bee and uh, Spokane Chronicle and several other papers. Well, he hadn't bothered to look at what they'd given him. This is the Chicago Daily News. It doesn't exist anymore, but Army finds air saucer on ranch in New Mexico. Disc goes to high officers found last week. Picked up last week, Roswell. And it only comes down to about here. Now, I mention this because there are people who say uh, it was a mogul balloon found on June 14th. June 14th is not last week from July 8th, the way my calendar works anyway. So uh, let's look at the next slide, please. There's the Roswell paper. That is not Royal Australian Air Force, as somebody tried to convince me. <laughs> Honest to God. Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. Now, there were also people who said they didn't use the term flying saucer. It was UFO. No, it wasn't UFO. It was flying saucer. <laughs> UFO is a modern term in the 50s, you know. Uh, this whole article, there's more about flying saucers there and there. and Big story. Uh, now, of course, what happened was the story goes out around noontime, Walter Hout put out this press release. Too late, that's noontime New Mexico time, which is much two hours later in New York. Didn't make any of the East Coast papers, but from Chicago West. Uh, the cover story came out in a couple hours. It's in the Los Angeles Herald Express, where it has generals, said, radar, let's see, how did they put it? Army captures flying saucer, general says it's radar weather gadget. This is in the same headline. By the next day, the general empties Roswell saucer. And that was the end of it until I came along. And it got very wide coverage. But of course, the East Coast papers didn't have it. The Washington Post, the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Boston Globe, whatever. Uh, Let's look at the next slide. It's a quick trip to New Mexico, you see. Albuquerque, White Sands Missile Range, the largest military base in the continental United States. Roswell's down here. Uh, first atomic bomb was tested here. Uh, that's where we, the, all the captured German V-2 rockets were tested. Now, why do you test bombs and rockets there? Because there ain't nobody there. You need a place that you can explode a bomb <laughs> or fire a rocket and hope it doesn't hit anybody. Now, the three important things now, any aliens visiting Earth in July 1947 would have known that soon we idiots, I mean, we Earthlings, would be going out, soon meaning less than 100 years. Why? Three things, nuclear weapons, powerful rockets, used to kill people, not to deliver the mail, and very good radar, which is the beginning of the electronics age, had our best radar because sometimes the rockets, instead of going up this way, went down this way. The Mexicans weren't very happy about that. Even without a bomb on board, you still don't like having rockets dropped in your lap. And the only place in the world in July 1947 where you could study all three of these was southeastern New Mexico, and there's Roswell. Bombs, rockets, interesting place. So you'd expect them to be checking things out there. Let's look at the next slide. 
There's Major Jesse Marcel. Is Jesse Jr. here tonight? Jesse? He'll be talking tomorrow morning. Dr. Jesse Marcel, the son of Major Marcel. Jess is a colonel. Got called back in the military at age 68. Flew 225 combat hours in Iraq as a flight surgeon. Uh, very special guy. I can say that he's not here. I'd say it if he was here, but I'd be a little more cautious. But uh, pretty special guy. Now, how often do you get a, a, an, a person as qualified as somebody who's got a medical degree, who's a flight surgeon, who put in 225 combat hours piloting helicopters in Iraq, and who served on aircraft accident investigative teams when he was in the military? How much more qualified do you want somebody to be? He's got it. They substituted junk from a radar reflector weather balloon combination. Let's look at the next slide. That's Jesse Sr. There's Colonel Ramey. He was uh, General Ramey, I'm sorry, and Colonel DuBose. Now, Ramey was head of the 8th Air Force. The 509th, which was the group that Jesse was the intelligence officer for, the most elite military group in the world. They dropped the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They dropped two more in Operation Crossroads in 1946 in the Pacific. These weren't a bunch of guys sitting around with nothing better to do than twiddle their thumbs and make up crazy stories. They were our first line of defense. They had nuclear weapons. Nobody else did in the world. That makes them pretty special. And Walter Haupt, the PR guy, had been a navigator bombardier. He was chosen to drop the instrument package over one of those two tests in 1946, and you pick your best people to do that, because if you don't get the instrument package right, what's the point of testing the bomb? He's dead now, very special guy, very well thought of in the community, et cetera, and I asked. Now, General Ramey's holding a letter in his hand. Now, if this was done with a typical digital camera, you wouldn't be able to read it, but let's look at the next slide. There are better versions of this. Uh, you can get a, a DVD out there with this. It has words in it like victims of the wreck. Now, everybody knows weather balloons have victims of the wreck. <laughs> Dr. David Rudiak in California did a very careful, detailed study of this memo. Uh, it does raise some serious questions about weather balloon. Let's look at the next slide. There's Thomas Jefferson DuBose. He was in that picture with General Ramey. I managed to find him, visited him. Uh, he took Don Schmidt and I to the best restaurant in town on my second visit to see him. Great old guy. He told us, and told me the first time I met with him, I was three feet away from him. He took a call from General Ramey's boss from General McMullen, giving him three orders. I want you to get the press off our backs. I don't care how you do it. Send some of that wreckage up here today to Washington, right here, uh, with one of your Colonel Couriers. This is from Fort Worth, Texas, mind you, which is right on the way from uh, Roswell to Washington, when you look at the map. Uh, and I don't want you ever to talk about it again, not even with your boss, Roger Ramey. That's an order. Do I need to put it in writing? No, sir. Tommy told me that, standing this close. Uh, they knew each other. Crusty old guy, he said, uh, General McMullen. And McMullen says, that's an order. Do I need to put it in writing? No, sir. Now, some people look at me. What do you mean, no, sir? Why wouldn't he protest about lying? Here's a general talking to a colonel two years after the end of the war, giving him an order. They're both West Pointers. He's going to disobey an order? That's crazy. He did what he was told. He didn't keep the end of the not telling anybody, but this is umpteen years later, as you can imagine, and everybody else is dead. Uh, but you've got to dig these guys out. It takes a lot of hard work. Let's look at the next slide. 
Oh, there's the next day. Harassed rancher who located saucer. Sorry he told about it. If I ever seen one again, I'll never report it. Uh, it's a long story. It's told in my book and in several other books. Kevin, are you here? Kevin Randall here? Well, some of his books are outside, and he's got some books about Roswell. I've got my book, Crash at Corona, about it, so you can find out more. Let's look at the next slide. Oh, the Air Force got in the act. Now, I'm not anti-Air Force. I just don't like them lying, and they've done it a lot. In 1994, Congressman Stephen Schiff from uh, New Mexico was raising a fuss. So the Air Force went on the defensive. Colonel Weaver, whose specialty was disinformation, isn't that amazing? Uh, put out this, re well, this is the second volume. The first one was the Roswell Report, Truth versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert. He supplied the fiction. Even lied about me, and I don't like being lied about, and had the ears wrong and other things. And he said in that first report, 1994, this is all we're going to say about Roswell. Then they put out this report three years later. Lied again. Uh, this has my favorite explanation for Roswell. Uh, crash test dummies. The Air Force was dropping crash test dummies all over the state. We did our homework, and they used the same map three times in this report. And uh, that's what it was. Now, let's look at the next slide. Yeah. Uh, the dummy's the one in the middle. Sierra Sam. I talked to this man umpteen years later. Uh, it was a retired colonel by that time, Colonel Madsen. This is in the Air Force report. I met with him in Albuquerque. He stressed two important things. That the dummies for the test to be meaningful had to be the same size and weight as pilots. They were six feet tall and 175 pounds. They were also in a flight suit. Because when you kick a body out of a ejection seat at 40,000 feet, it affects the temperature, the drag, the, how quickly it falls, and all the rest of the things. Now, can you imagine anybody in New Mexico or any place else stumbling across one of these guys? Oh my God, an alien invasion! <laughs> Somehow being dropped shrinks them from six feet tall to four feet tall. They got away with it. It made front page on the New York Times above the fold. Pretty darn stupid. Oh, uh, another word, problem with the explanation. None were dropped until 1953. So we got crash test dummies, time traveled, and morphing into aliens. That's pretty neat. Stupid, but neat. It, the funny thing is, why didn't the Air Force talk to him? They show his picture from umpteen years before, but they didn't talk to him. I talked to him. I don't know if anybody else has, but he wasn't hard to find. And I go to New Mexico fairly often to go to Roswell, of course. Come on down to the Big Wing Ding, the festival, uh, July 5th, 6th, 7th. Lots of lectures and parades and all kinds of goodies. Let's look at the next slide. You know, we don't have time to do a lot of work on this, do we? Okay. Uh, the famous MJ-12 document, which came in the mail, it says President Truman set up a group called Majestic 12 to deal with uh, Roswell and the whole UFO situation. I've done a lot of research on that. There's a book out there, Top Secret Magic. Bob Wood up here has, you got one or two books out there, Bob? I don't know. Two? Two books. You want to find out more about it. I'm convinced there was really a Majestic 12. There's a whole bunch of phony documents. I don't care about those. The three, at least, that I say are genuine. Let's look at the next slide. This lists the members of this exotic group. Next slide. Uh, some of these you may know. The strange one was Dr. Donald Menzel. He was supposedly a big UFO debunker. Wrote three anti-UFO books, a Harvard professor of astronomy. Everybody else had high-level security clearances. But you don't need a high-level security clearance to teach astronomy at Harvard. I didn't believe it. I had had one run-in with him. I didn't like him. But I had to get permission from three different people to see his papers at Harvard. I went there. I was totally astonished by what I found. He had a longer continuous association with the National Security Agency. He told 
John F. Kennedy, who was on the board of overseers at Harvard, and they knew, and Menzel, his area of interest was astronomy. Well, that came as a shock. Uh, there's a lot more. It's in my books. Uh, I was very impressed with what I found. Nobody else knew about Menzel's sub rosa work for the government for more than 30 years after the war. Longest continuous association with the NSA, he said to Kennedy. When we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. That's the present. Uh, it's a fascinating story. A lot of arguments. I think I've at least made sure three documents are genuine and probably several more. Let's look at the next one. This is one of the other documents. I don't have time to go into this. The next one, there are three of these. And the next one, yeah, this one we found, and it mentions NSC, National Security Council, and MJ-12. And the paper has a watermark, and we could check on that. Well, Phil Klass, the noisiest negativist of them all, said, aha, I challenge you. The typeface is wrong. That's a large pica type, but I have nine documents from the NSC. They're all in elite type. I'll give you $100 each for every genuine document done at the same time, same size and style type, bunch of other limitations. And you have 60 days. Well, I was going to the Eisenhower Library anyway. He's never been there. He got his documents by mail. I went there, I dug out 14 documents done in the same large pica type, made copies, sent him copies, and an invoice for $1,000 because he set a limit of 10, and he paid me. Didn't tell anybody about paying me, he told everybody about challenging me. And his papers are at the American Psycho uh, Philosophical Society Library in, uh, in Philadelphia. There's no Friedman file. We corresponded for 20 years, nothing there. Next one, please. There's his check. And he got madder than hell at me when I published a copy of his check <laughs> and something I wrote. I told him, Phil, you sent me a check. I Xeroxed it. I took the check to the bank. They cashed it. I can do whatever I darn please with the Xerox. He shut up. Never told anybody that he paid me, of course. Next slide, please. There's my book, Top Secret Magic, about Majestic 12, the big challenging this is the second edition. Next slide. There's Jesse Marcel Jr.'s book. And I've signed because I wrote the forward. And if you can catch him at this conference, he's going to be on the program tomorrow. One of those panel things. Get him to sign. And I have a few copies. He didn't bring any. Next slide. There's my book, Crash at Corona, which is the nearest small town, nearest town of any kind to where the crash occurred. They love me in Corona. They had a marquee on an th old theater there. Forget about Roswell, it all happened here. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, we interviewed 27 witnesses, most of all of whom are dead now. But if you want to hear the original witnesses, there are DVDs out there. 